Shalom, my name is Joseph Shulam. I'm continuing the teaching of First Samuel. We've gotten to halfway through the book, almost halfway through the book. And I think I was yesterday all day long in the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem with some heart issues, went through a lot of tests, begged them to release me to uh, go home and sleep at home. And I'm going to continue the test this week in, uh, through the Maccabi Insurance Company uh, outside of the hospital. If I have more trouble, immediately I will be received at the emergency room back in the Hadassah Hospital. I'm feeling okay and uh, I had time to think yesterday in the hospital. And I thought, you know, we need to do a review, a catch-up review halfway through the book because this book is, is full of, of, of very, very major changes. Uh, the biggest change is from the period of the judges to the period of the kings. And the, the agency that produces the kingdom or enables the kingdom is the agency of the prophets that has been of course Abraham is considered a prophet Rebecca is considered a prophet Jacob is considered a prophet they're not called prophets but they prophesy they give blessings that are prophetic and they receive promises of God that are prophetic but actual people who are called prophets, whose job, whose, whose, whose main purpose is prophets, starts with Samuel. Not yet classical in, in the full sense of the world, but popular prophets, people that that was their job, not only their calling, but their job. And that one of the big changes between the period of the judges and so forth. But when we start reading the book of Samuel, we start with a barren woman named Hannah, the wife of Elimelech, who has two wives. One has lots of children. The other one is barren. And Samuel is the product of prayer. Hannah prays fervently in the tabernacle in Shiloh for a son with, with ecstatic crying and, and ecstatic uh, behavior. She speaks, she mumbles. Uh, Eli, the high priest, thinks that she's drunk too much wine and that she's drunk and and the, the result of this ecstatic outpouring of her spirit, God answers her prayer and gives her a son. None of the other judges are, have this kind of birth stories. Some of them, we meet them when they were already adults and working in the fields. The only other judge in the book of Judges that has something similar to that is Samson. His birth is announced by an angel to his mother and to his father in the end. And the reason is because he's an unusual prophet. He's a prophet that, that doesn't like his job. His calling is a, 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 no, he's an unusual judge, excuse me. And he doesn't like his job. He's attracted by the culture of these foreigners, Philistines that came from Crete, from Greece, from the Minoan culture. But most of the other judges, we meet them when they're already old men, grown-up people, so to speak. So why does this book of, of, of Samuel, this transitional figure, we are told his birth and the fact that he was dedicated from his birth, from before his birth, to be a servant of God. We're told this because of this major shift 
from judges to prophets. A shift that will bring a bigger shift from priests and prophets to kings. And, and uh, that shift is a change of, of the basic paradigm of the children of Israel that were what's called professionally an Amphictyonian union of loose tribes that compete within themselves but have something in common that ties them together and that is their faith in one God, in, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their forefathers. And uh, even though they are syncretistic, in other words, they're, sometimes they worship the Baal and the Asherah and God at the same time. They're, you know, not fully grounded into the monotheistic idea. And, and they become, they have to become a, a united kingdom under a king. And so Samuel is dedicated by God through his mother to the service of God from his birth, but he's raised in the, in the tabernacle in, in Shiloh. And Eli, the last of these high priest in Shiloh has children who are corrupt and, and God punishes his children, his family, and he dies, I, I, I would say, out of grief, out of sorrow, out of old age, out of sickness, whatever it is, he dies. And, and Samuel understands that the main thing that God wants is not the temple worship, the tabernacle worship, but he wants the people to have a heart, to be united, to love each other, to love God, to uh, serve God, not in a syn syncretistic way like an idol. It's, it's possible to serve the true God, creator of the universe, and make an idol out of him. It's possible to believe in Yeshua, in his divinity, his messiahship, his mission, his, his disciples, his, his kingdom, and make an idol out of him. It's very possible, and that's what the majority of what we see in the Christian world, that's what it is. It is an idealization, making into an idol, of the Son of God, of, of the Jew from Nazareth that died on the Roman cross, resurrected after three days. We, you know, most of the Christian world worships him as if they worship Zeus or Apollo or one of the other Greco-Roman gods uh, or Prometheus, the son of Zeus that brought salvation, gave the secret of life to, the, to humanity and, and then was persecuted by his father, punished, strapped on a rock to suffer for the rest of eternity. So uh, all these things are in the kernel, in the seed, of the book of Samuel. And, and now we've got to the point where there is a king, King Saul, and he's beginning to flounder in his kingship. He's insecure, he's uh, a little bit paranoid, a little bit fearful, and he doesn't know what to do, and he still needs Samuel, but Samuel is old, not capable of leading very much. So we're at this point, so I want to review. Okay. The scene changes. Samuel is a prophet. That's his job. He's in Ramah, outside of Jerusalem, maybe 
13 miles and uh, his center there is not far from where his parents lived and not far from where his parents had their home and he's, he's, he's left Shiloh the ark is not there anymore he's in the house of Obed Adom in Kiryat Yarim which is also not very far from Rema and it's also not very far from Jerusalem and right now there is a major dig done by the University of Tel Aviv uh, and by a French university in, in Kiryat Yarim. Fantastic things are being discovered there and uh, big controversies, archaeological controversies are being perpetrated there at Kiryat Yarim right now. But back to Samuel. Samuel crowns Saul. By God's decree, God says a man will come to you, a young man, crown him. And Saul comes looking for the jackasses and he gets crowned. However, Saul, although being a very good looking young man, tall, head and shoulders above the people, good looking, but he's insecure. We see his insecurity from the fact that his servant, whose name we don't know, is the, the active part in looking for the, the, the donkeys of his father. It's the servant who gives him advice. There is a man of God up here in the hill. Let's go to the man of God. Saul says, well, we don't have any money or any, anything to give him. The servant says, I have a, a, a quarter shekel uh, of silver. We can give him that thing. They go up there. Saul is passive. Samuel takes all the active part in the story. Samuel invites him. Samuel brings him. Samuel takes him up on the roof and anoints him privately, without even without the servant being there. Just Samuel and Saul are being together on the roof. And he anoints him there with oil and says, now you're a king. What does Saul do? He goes back home. He goes back to tend his farm. King. He has no army. He has no administration. He has nothing. But he's king. Divinely appointed king. Anointed by Samuel the prophet. Until... News comes that uh, in Jebesh Gilead, on the Transjordan, on the top, not far from Beit Shan, it's the city of Jerish in Jordan today. It was a very big, famous Roman, Greco-Roman city and center. And news comes that the, the, the people of Jerish are being threatened by their enemies, by the uh, Midianites, by the Ammonites, excuse me, by the Ammonites that they will give them a possibility of surviving and, and, and being under them, being conquered by them, by the Ammonites, on condition that their each man, his right eye will be plucked out. They will be blind by one eye, which is the action of communication, of, of humiliation, and of course, a sign of, of submission. So, the news comes to Saul, the newly anointed king, who's back in his farm. And uh, he's been anointed already twice, once privately and once publicly by the prophet. But there also we see his total insecurity. They're looking for him to anoint him, to, to crown him as king of Israel in front of all the delegates from all the tribes. And, and he is hiding. He's hiding. They have to look for him. Where is the, the, the candidate for for the crown, where the crown? He's hiding. He's insecure, young man. But when he hears about this 
problem at Jebesh Gilead, north near Beit Shan. He doesn't know what to do. But what he does is he gets a cow, cuts it into 12 pieces, and uh, sends messengers to every tribe and says, if you guys don't join me in this battle against the Ammonites to save our brothers and all of Israel from being humiliated, I'm going to cut you like I cut this cow. Did he need that kind of a drastic measure? Maybe yes, maybe no. But his insecurity expressed itself in a very strong and radical way to make sure that the tribes of Israel will unite to help their brothers in Jebesh Gilead. And he does that. And not all the tribes, but most of the tribes join this battle and they drive away the Ammonites and they save their brothers in Jebesh Gilead. And this was the first big national action that Saul takes out of his insecurity out but but why shouldn't he be insecure there has never been a king in Israel before he's the first he doesn't have a backlog a history of how kings should behave he doesn't have a backlog or history of how kings should unite the people but he takes this radical action, he cuts the cow to 12 pieces, he sends them to all the tribes by messengers, and he threatens them. He threatens them, if you don't join, I'm going to cut you up. Not that he have a possibility of doing it. You could call it a bluff when you talk about poker playing. He bluffs them, but they understand that their brothers across the Jordan in Jebesh Gilead are in trouble. And if the enemy of Israel, the Ammonites, the Midianites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Girgashites, the Prezites, the Jebusites, if their brothers see that one of their tribes and one of the big cities, Jebesh, Gilead, is humiliated and nobody does anything about it, the whole Amphictyonian union of the tribes of Israel will boom, fall apart. I don't think they joined the battle against the Ammonites because they were afraid of King Saul that cut up a cow and sent them the piece of beef. I don't think that that was the real motivation. The real motivation was we are a part of a whole. We are a part of, of, of a body called Israel. And even though each one of us has his territory and each one of us has his, his history and each one of us has, has his own, you know, forefathers, his own genealogy. From the days of Jacob, our forefather, we have some degree of responsibility toward each other. And here I'm shifting the book of Samuel and bringing it today. Bringing us to us, to our home today, to our churches today, to our synagogues today. We are also a kind of union, whether we like it or not. 
even if we don't realize that we are a union, an Amphictyonian union, a loose tribal relationship that has a common root, a common history. If we don't realize that, if we don't understand that the Methodists are somehow connected to us, and the Baptists are somehow connected to us, and the Pentecostals are somehow connected to us, then the Catholics and the Greek Orthodox and the Ethiopians and the Presbyterians and the thousands of denominations are somehow connected. We have a common root. If we don't realize that, and if somebody as a leader doesn't get up, even though he may be insecure, he may be unpopular, he may be untrained, he may be somebody that God touches, does something radical. Look at the, our period of the corona. We are under attack. I think we are under attack from God himself. Who says, you guys got to get it together. You've got to see that you're a part of the same root. Same history. What the Germans call the das Heilgeschichte, the history of salvation. We're a part of the same. Yes, we broke up into tribes and we have competition and enmity and hate and love and whatever you want to call it between us. Like the children of Israel in those days. And each denomination is to itself and thinks that they can survive alone. Like the children of Israel during the days of the judges, each judge judged his own tribe, judged his own territory, that judged his own people and didn't care, was not affected. By what's happening are the other tribe, their neighboring tribes. This is the first time that King Saul, that is inexperienced, young, insecure, takes action, cuts up a cow and says, Hey folks, if logic and love and good reason doesn't make you come to the aid of your brothers in Jebesh Gilead, then I am going to cut you. Who are you? They could have said, you're bluffing us. You don't have an army. You don't have an administration. You have nothing. What are you scaring us for? No. But they, that action of that young man's soul moves them to understand we have a common responsibility. We have a common root. We have a common relationship. I don't care if you live in Japan or in China or in Honolulu or in Australia or New Zealand or Antarctica or, or Nor Norway and Finland at the North Pole. I don't care if you're speaking Russian or Arabic. But because we believe in the same God and in the same Messiah, we have something in common and we better unite to help our brothers who are in need. That was Saul, King Saul's first real royal action. And he succeeds. This Mr. Nobody that was hiding when they, they were crowning him in Mitzpah succeeds. And they saved their brothers at Jebesh Gilead from becoming blind with one eye. And they unite to some degree, at least some degree, realizing we are a nation and we have one king over this nation. We can criticize, we can 
you know, ignore. But the final outcome is we are a nation. We are one. A big transition problem, problem from judges to priests to prophet to king. That is the transition. And that's where we are now. Where we are now is that after the vi victory, over the Ammonites. Samuel, the old man, realizes now the real crowning with all of Israel leadership being there is going to be in an old, old strategic place at the Gilgal. We're going to gather at the Gilgal and we're going to offer sacrifices to the Lord in the place that when our forefathers crossed the Jordan River 200 and some years earlier, they all got circumcised and rededicated and kept the Passover together for the first time in 40 years after they left Egypt. Let's go down to the Gilgal and, and, and reunite. That's how far we got. We're going to enter into chapter 12 soon. And we're going to see further development. And slowly, slowly, we're going to get to King David. And slowly, slowly, we're going to see the, the formation of a nation out of a bunch of loosely united tribes. And I'm doing this review, folks, in order to bring us home. What do we have now? We have a king, I would say an absentee king. He's a king. We all recognize him as a king. We all recognize that he built the kingdom and that we ought to be, we ought to be a part of that kingdom, one kingdom under God. Indivisible. In which we all trust in God in spite of what is written on the dollar or what used to be written on the dollar bill. In God we trust. The question is which God? But I'm talking about the real God, the creator of the universe that, that built the heavens and the earth, created the earth and the sky the stars and the moon and the sun in the fourth day of creation. We are part of that, that, that paradigm, yes. And the sooner we realize that we are one, one, one in Christ, one in the Messiah, one in, in the oneness of God himself, the Father, of us all and that uh, we have enemies that are outside idolaters pagans people who are not only pagan but they're against God and against his people as soon as we realize that and recrown him over our lives as king not only as a Jew hanging on a cross to have our sins forgiven, but as a Jew that came off the cross and was put in the grave and came out of the grave to rule, not only now in this world, messed up world, but to rule for eternity in a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom that will have no cancer and no death and uh, no enmity and no hate and no division, but we will all be in the presence of God, continuing to do his will 
in a new heavens and a new earth. Not in the clouds, not in an abstract, not in a virtual world, but in a real world in which Yeshua will be king. And love will be the constitution. That perfect world in which we all pray for and wait for and work for and live for. But in order for this to happen, if we don't realize our common responsibility, when I say common, I mean all those who claim that Yeshua is their savior. All those who claim that Yeshua is the son of God. All those who claim that Yeshua is divine. All those who claim that God's revelation is from Genesis to, Re to from the book of Genesis 1-1 to the end of the book of Revelation. And that the, the eternal plan for mankind is drawn out there in detail enough for us to start implementing. Yep. So that's the, the paradigm of the half of the book of Samuel. We're entering now into another shift. Another shift. Another change that God wants to reveal to us through the story of Samuel, Saul, and King David, and the shift that is not easy. There is moments of joy in it, and there are moments of great sadness in it. But again, it's a revelation of our human frailty, our human weaknesses, in relationship and in respect to God's love and God's grace and God's provision and care for his children, even under the conditions of imperfection in our lives, in our behaviors, and in our existence as homo sapiens, as human intelligent beings created by God himself. So God bless all of you soon. Today I'm going to get back maybe in an hour and continue from chapter 11 and 12 of the book of 1 Samuel. God bless all of you. You can react and write and, uh, and ask questions uh, through the web page of nativia.org or if you know my email or the office's email, you're welcome. God bless you all.